we have a lot of folks from Scopely discussing how to find the right audiences for your game, why community building is more important than ever, and how a global game team that spans continents and time zones can create unique game-making magic. Please welcome to the stage Amy Jo Kim of Game Thinking, Massimo Maietti of DM and VP of Product at Scopely, and Howard Chin, Senior Art Director at Scopely, who are going to share their unique insights. Please welcome our panelists to the stage. All right. It's great to see everyone here. This is always the best crowd at GameSpeed. I'm Amy Jo Kim, and I'm known for being on the original design team of The Sims. Maybe some of you played The Sims. Rock Band, Covet Fashion, Ultima Online. And now I coach teams and game companies to find product market fit. Massimo? I'm Massimo uh, Maieri, uh, GM of Monopoly Go at Scopely. Been in games for almost half of my life now, and, uh, and been at Scopely for seven of those uh, years. Uh, and uh, yeah, trying to make, I spent all those years trying to make uh, a good Monopoly game for Scopely. Before that, I was a Zynga, and before that, I was part of a couple of startups in the United Kingdom. Hello, uh, my name is Howard Shin. I am the senior art director on Monopoly Go. Been in the games for, yeah, about leadership role in like 10 years. Um, prior to Scopely, I was with uh, King in Stockholm and worked on titles such as uh, Candy Crush Friends and uh, Crash Bandicoot uh, on the go. Oh, on the run, sorry, on the run. And with uh, Monopoly, yeah, with Scopely, I've now been with the team for about three years. So today we're going to talk about how you take beloved IP and bring it to modern gaming platforms. And if any of you have ever tried to do that, you know what a trick that is. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. But these folks have done it not just once, but multiple times. So speaking of Monopoly Go, how did your team identify and meet the market appetite for this new Monopoly experience? How did you go about it? Yeah. Um... It was, uh, I think, despite the fact that the game, if you play today, feels sort of natural, maybe inevitable, the way we found our path there was definitely not uh, sort of linear, right? From the very beginning, we knew that Monopoly had a great potential. You know, Scopely had great results with Yahtzee and other sort of, uh, 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 sort of board games. And we knew that, you know, relative to those, Monopoly is the premier experience. And so we thought, how big can this be? Um, but the process of understanding what is truly resonating and was truly great about Monopoly uh, was definitely a process of uh, discovery. It was not clear to us from the beginning. We were very excited. We love the game. Uh, we love the fact that it's both timeless and it resonates today with the sort of uh, discussion around wealth and all those things. Uh, but for instance, we started from maybe as you expect from game developers, uh, from a take uh, on the game that was more like midcore, a synchronous PvP version of, of the game, very skill-based. And, uh, and then we felt something, a game that we could make, given our past experience and so forth. And as we go through the process of testing it and understanding it, uh, we realized that despite the fact that that initial approach was, uh, was making a, uh, for a good game, uh, it was not the right game for the Monopoly audience. And, uh, and so, you know, we were brave enough to, to take full account of that knowledge and to just move on to what eventually became the game that we built, right? And, uh, and in the, the process, I think, maybe three things that we learned uh, were, one, that if you want to make a game for a very sort of universal audience, as we are finding today that the Monopoly audience is, uh, you know, maybe making a game that is high skill uh, ceiling and very complicated is not the right way to go. And the introduction of luck as, a, as, a, as an element the game was really very successful. The second one is that if you're making a synchronous PvP game, it's very hard to play with your friends. They might not be there at the same time. And, uh, and our players love to play with their friends. They wanted to invite their family. And so we thought clearly the right way to build this game is to maximize the opportunity for for players to be with each other, to invite their friends, to have the feeling that they're playing with their family. 
And maybe the last lesson that was the least intuitive of all was that in a high skill game, the way you get rich, right, the goal of the game is to get rich, is really to, you know, take a lot of actions, think very hard, and uh, min max your way to wealth. And that's not what Monopoly is about. Monopoly, we understood really after some <laughs> deep thinking and lots of reading books and playing the game, is about the multiplication of capital. You are rich and you get richer, and it's somewhat effortless, right? I'm rich enough to buy a hotel, people stop there, and I get richer, and I get richer, and so on forever. And so the notion of wealth multiplying itself, as opposed to the sweat equity of just earning every cent, right, well, was made a turn, really, away from, uh, from the sort of skill, labor-intensive, cognitively uh, uh, engaging game to, to a new sort of uh, a new direction, um, the one liner we have, what, what we had was uh, ride the roller coaster to ridiculous riches, right? Where uh, you ride this ups and down roller coaster as opposed to driving to different directions, right? And after we learned all these lessons, uh, uh, we felt finally that this was the most authentic version we could make for a free-to-play Monopoly game, and, and everything became slightly easier after that. Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, you have to be wrong on the way to being right. Yeah. And so, Howard, how did you approach the art and the creative direction? Sure. So for art, you know, Monopoly doesn't have the deepest lore <laughs> or narrative. And so that didn't feel like the right path to go. And more importantly, I think we started from the why, like, why are we building this? And uh, from there, everything started to come into play. So our GM, Massimo, actually coined the phrase, Howard, we're making a timeless game. It has, it, it has to be a game that mixes, you know, the old, uh, you know, the game that was starting to be marketed in the 1930s to today. Uh, at the time, it was 2020. And how do we bridge that together? And again, the word that uh, Massimo coined was, we're trying to create a timeless experience. And so from there, everything started to kind of boil down to, okay, how do we actually get to timelessness? And so the entire sort of art direction started to get driven by uh, a slogan that I had put together for the team. And the slogan was specific enough, yet wide enough for interpretation. And so the slogan for us was uh, Scrooge Chaplin racing in Legopoly. If we can capture that sentiment, I felt that the art was moving in the right direction. The four pillars, Scrooge uh, refers to Scrooge McDuck, uh, from the Disney cartoons, and it was to capture this ridiculousness of, of uh, wanting to be rich and richer and richer, and trying to capture the humor and the fun of it rather than being cynical. We use Charlie Chaplin um, as a, sort of an animation uh, direction where everything was just over the top. Uh, nothing needed to be really spoken or written out because the action should do most of the talking. We also use uh, racing, uh, refers to the racing posters, uh, like those old Monaco uh, classic racing posters. Uh, we sort of looked at that for our colors. Uh, they were such a vibrant way to use graphic colors. Um, that became one of the pillars. And then the very last fourth pillar was looking at Lego. And uh, Lego does an amazing job of uh, going to very different universe, right? They do Harry Potter, Star Wars, they have their own thing. But in the end, they all live in the LEGO world. And knowing that this game, uh, we want to take our players to all the different parts of the world and time and you know, any type of uh, uh, world you can imagine, uh, we wanted to make sure that we have a shape language that will make, make sure that the entire world is consistent. Apart from just, again, creating an arbitrary art direction, one of the main reasons that we set up these as our four pillars was because uh, both, uh, not both, uh, Lego, uh, those racing posters, uh, as well as Charlie Chaplin, were all very relevant in 1930s, as well as they are relevant today. And so it not only visually made sense for us to put this as our pillars, but symbolically, it also really tried to capture, the, again, the why, which is we're trying to create something that's timeless. And so, you know, when you look at our character, uh, Mr. Monopoly, you know, you will see a bit of uh, Charlie Chaplin's, like, you know, crazy over-the-top animation. 
Uh, Design-wise, it's a mix of Lego, for example, with those little dot eyes that you see, as well as uh, funness of, of uh, uh, Scrooge McDuck, kind of cartoonish, a uh, little bit, again, little, just a little bit more over the top than usual. Uh, same thing with our buildings. If you look at our uh, boards, they're all rather primitive in shape. They're very simple and blocky. And again, that was uh, uh, largely inspired by uh, looking at Lego and how they build uh, their, their little tiny towns. And then, you know, finally for our colors, I think for a lot of the audience, it may look like, you know, animation uh, cell shade type of illustration. But for us, we were really inspired by, again, the graphic nature of and the colorful nature of these 1930s Monaco racing posters. And that four pillars started to really become sort of the vision that I had, that when I shared with both product um, designers uh, as well as the artists, they also brought their own little take and spin, and it became really like what I had was a 2D uh, vision, if you will, and when, once everyone jumped in and started to take that idea, and within the, the boundaries of what we have set up, they were being able to be uh, uh, creative partners and truly owning the vision with me and running together and making the vision even fuller than, uh, than how we started, yeah. That was amazing. So y'all just got a mini masterclass in how to approach branded IP between these two stories. And you look at a game, go look at Monopoly Go, it's beautiful, the art is gorgeous, it looks inevitable. All that went into something that looks inevitable. The gameplay looks inevitable. All those twists and turns go into the gameplay that looks inevitable. And those of you who have developed games know that who you test your game on matters. And you can get completely different requests and feedback on the same game features and core systems if you talk to different people. And that's one of the trickiest things about game dev. So how do you figure out who to talk to, what audience to target, and most importantly, who to test your game on. Um, yeah, that's another <laughs> interesting journey. Right. Um, I think uh, maybe two, two interesting uh, aspects to share about that journey. Uh, the first one is that even before thinking about uh, who is the right audience, uh, we felt, again, we need to connect on, on the um, on the why of the game, right? Why is the why people have those memories? We knew that everybody who was going to install the game would, would have some connection to Monopoly, right? So what is that connection? Uh, we talk about timelessness or nostalgia, but nostalgia, you know, for what? And so we felt that we need to answer that question to be able to have a voice that would be authentic, right? And uh, and so we continue sort of thinking about it and, and, and prodding the, the the brand and all the assets and, and all the ideas that we could sort of uh, uh, share with each other, and um, and again, when, when we truly started hitting, uh, finding ground on this game was when we, we understood that the nostalgia, at least that was our theory, I don't know if it explains the whole reason why Monopoly is so successful, but it was a very fertile one that we could use to make things, right, to make the game. And our theory was that it was the, that nostalgia was driven by the sort of conflagration between the intimacy of familiar relationship, the, you know, you, 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 you play the game with your friends and family at a very young age, and in your family everybody contributes what they can, and it's a, it's a very sort of a equal environment. And then wealth and the market arrives, right? And now you're negotiating the marketplace into your family, so you have the experience of asking your mother to pay you rent, bankrupting your father, and uh, making a side deal with a friend to bankrupt a third friend, and, uh, and things like that, right? And so the contrast between, between the sort of equality and sharing of the familial environment and the rules of the market and the price-setting <laughs> uh, nature of, of, of all of that felt were potentially the, the emotional core of the game, right? And so that for us uh, talked about not only the audience, but also what the audience wanted from each other, and in what relationship the audience wanted to be, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how we have this, in the game you can find today, it, our social systems are pretty interesting in that with the same folks, you can collaborate and compete. And in many games, you have clans, right, where you can only, comp it's very tribal, right? I can collaborate with my clanmates, and everybody else is an enemy. But in our game, 
you compete, collaborate, uh, uh, align with, uh, depart from everybody in the world, and you do that more and more with the people next to you in your sort of in-game uh, social network. And so, even as we talk about the audience, we talk about not just a single person, right? But what, what does it take for us to have an audience that is a group, like a family, right? So how does a family play together? And so that was sort of the, the first, the first sort of uh, uh, the first point about the audience as a group and not as individuals. And then when it comes to how do you test it, uh, for sure we had extensive uh, user research and and we used you know uh, uh, Scopely as uh, as lots of uh, incredible resources, right, to understand what the market is and what the audience is. And on top of that, uh, we chose also, I think, another sort of um, deliberate decision we made was to keep things simple. For an audience like Monopoly, you can have you know, eight different personas, right? It's so universal that you can really uh, try to be sort of overly scientific and try to adjust your game and asking what, did, what does persona A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, uh, uh, react to each of the features, right? And for us, instead, we identified some sort of very simple features of a universal audience, and we just noted how we can become that audience ourselves, as opposed to thinking our way to what that audience could like. We just started play the game a lot, play Monopoly constantly, play you know, a similar experience playing our game, uh, to sort of become that kind of audience that can then feed back into the process, right? Um, and, uh, and that worked. I don't know that if it's a universal lesson, but at least I know that in some cases it can work. Yeah. So building on that, you mentioned you have really interesting social systems and you really leveraged a lot of the resources to find the audience. So how do you leverage gameplay to build with community building in mind? How does community and community building play into this? Yeah, I mean, we we decided that we wanted to have uh, social not be uh, sort of a layer that is uh, living somewhere in the game, but to have it as a, as a line throughout every experience, right? So if you play the game today, uh, you will see other humans on the board that they, if you land on them, they, they will pay rent to you, right? So even from the very second-to-second -second interaction, you might have a, a social interactions by having somebody play rent to you, right? Uh, that is competitive. You can also land on a community chest, which is cooperative, where you actually are uh, so contribute to your chest and your friends playing will let that chest get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so in every layer of the game, you, from the second-to-second -second moment to, let's say, a three-month cycle, which is our sort of collection, album, collection feature, where you can trade with your friends and so on, uh, there's a social component basically throughout, right? And so we decided that social was not a feature, was just a lens. And every feature had to answer the question, how does it play with my friend? And then there's the whole part that is outside of the game itself, right? So we have a very active community of, uh, of, uh, of people who trade those stickers on Facebook, and most probably other communities all around social media will be created. And so uh, is literally, I see it as a concentric circles where it starts from the very core interaction, right, uh, of rolling and having a friend pay rent to you. Um, so yeah, it was pretty unfettered, and we keep on asking the question for everything that we do, uh, what is the social dynamics, uh, uh, how are the, do, those going to interact with, with this feature or this system, yeah. Do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think Amosma covers okay. it pretty well. But yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of art in general, uh, we were very closely together with the design. And so even from the very start, any feature that gets started, um, some of the key art leads are brought in early to really explain what the goal is. And like as Massimo said, goal is always how, does, how do we maximize you know, social interactions with, uh, with those that we were playing together. And that really, again, played a key part in driving a lot of the art direction or uh, any type of art assets uh, that gets created for uh, individual features that we work on. Yeah. So building on that, you know, you're talking about how people work together and strategy and design and art are all coming together and you're running experiments and learning. And it comes down to people, people working together. So you've got a global team. You have a distributed team. How many people in here work with a distributed team? People not in the same office. Right? It's very common. So how do you pull off this game-making magic with your distributed team? Tell us some things you've learned about working effectively together. Uh, maybe I can start. 
Yeah, this game was built uh, also somewhat in concentric circle. It started in California, and then we expanded to Colorado, the rest of the United States, and then Europe. And, and now we are a global team uh, that goes from uh, Los Angeles to Tel Aviv. So there's 10 hour time zone difference. And there's literally, you know, including UK as well now, and, and there's literally five or six different cultures, different ways of seeing, of perceiving authority, different ways of uh, making decisions, right? And I think in all of these cases, uh, it was very important that the process was uh, gradual, right? That we could find uh, an identity for the team before we could expand and invite others to add to it. I think had we started uh, uh, globally already, it would have been very hard to find this sort of strong sense of purpose and mission, right? But at the same time, as we expanded and we found, uh, you know, there's great advantages, right? There's some certain, in some of these locations we're in, there's, there's, a, there's sort of a strength in a specific aspect of game making that we are leveraging, right? Um, uh, but how do we benefit from that? strength without paying the cost of, let's say, you know, slowdown in decision making or, you know, misalignment. And that has been certainly like uh, something that we had to work on and to constantly sort of uh, 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 care for the relationship, right, and, and so forth. I would say, though, that uh, in general, we've been uh, good at making sure that everybody can express their own uh, approach, their own point of view, and, uh, and we've uh, sort of erred in the direction of uh, tolerance for diversity and letting diversity sort of play out as opposed to sort of channeling decision making too quickly. And my theory is that that led to uh, not only good retention in terms of the people who are on the project like to stay on the project, but also to a game that is somewhat universal because somehow along the way we've incorporated all those perspectives and point of views and each of them sort of affected somehow the direction that we, that we went down. Mm. Um, yeah, as, as Massimo covered how to work internationally, if we're to think uh, also internally, even within each uh, location, and how the, you know, again, product design, art, how they all sort of mesh together to create features and art and gameplay and so on and so forth. Um, I think a good example that I think Massimo can also speak to is uh, our core, which is the, the role. As creatives, you know, uh, we had both the concept and animation just trying to do every which thing that they can do within the, that role view. Like, can we have the camera go down low and follow the tokens as they jump around? Can we have the camera up high and then just kind of turn as the tokens move around the board? There's so many different things that we wanted to do creatively. But working with the product, again, they have a very specific mission. How does this add to the core loop? How does this play into the sociability of? And once the team started to really work together, I think one of the big lessons from trying to get that sticky core right was just because we have the power to do it doesn't also necessarily mean that we should do it. And uh, if you look at the, the role, it must look to most players like, Oh, it's the simplest thing. Like, of course, you click this and the dice and drops and you move the tokens. But that was actually the hardest thing to get right. And because we're trying to do so many creative things, again, we went around right, uh, you know, circles and uh, iterating and what have you. And eventually, again, as I was saying earlier, the restraint of creatives going, I understand what the objective of this particular feature or this core loop is, and therefore, Going with something that, that feels a little bit more standard uh, felt right after, again, so many iterations. And that was the type of collaborative effort that I think uh, both the product, the art, and everyone involved uh, really sort of took away from that experience. Yeah. A little anecdote I have on, on that very sort of topic is the, the fact that, again, rolling on our board seems pretty natural and sort of uh, the first thing you would try, although it was kind of the last thing that we tried. Uh, and there was a whole six months where our game would cause literally motion sickness to our players. And it's the same role that you see today. Basically, the token was moving. We, we didn't want the player to, and this is to talk about the subtleties of things that seem so simple, right? We didn't want the player's eyes to be strained too much by looking around as the token moves along the board, right? And so if, if you f your eyes follow the dice rolling on the board, the token starts moving, and then stopping somewhere, uh, things coming out, getting to their UI and back, right? We want to minimize 
high motion because I think we thought it was more sort of a, a more relaxing experience. But the less the token moves around the board, the more the board needs to move around it, right? Uh, uh, think in the extreme section that the, the token stays close, stays still, and the rest of the board moves below it, right, uh, as, as the role progresses. And that will cause a, a, a huge amount of seasickness. And, uh, and so we had to really understand how the token moves and the board moves, the ratio of these two movements, to create a role that is, doesn't make you seasick, but also is, doesn't create strain on your eyes as you follow the action, right? And again, what we have seems natural, but uh, it was a very sculptural path, meaning we have to remove all the material that was wrong <laughs> and we were left with this. And, uh, and hopefully this will carry the game for, for a long time. So can you just quickly follow up on this, either of you, and talk a little bit more about how you do testing? We have a couple of minutes, but you talked a lot about iteration and testing. So how do you do that? Do you do it remotely? Do you bring people in? Any Yeah, very tips? quickly. Yeah, as we build the game, my, my advice to you, depending on product uncertainty that might be in your product, the higher the uncertainty, the more you should test in all possible ways. And so we started from having playtests every week in our team. And initially, they were very short because we didn't have much. And they became longer over time, bigger in terms of feature set, and bigger in terms of audience. So we started involving then uh, scope lens, right? Other teams at uh, other teams of Scopely contributed a massive amount because we had hundreds of people playing the game weekly for for the length of the development. Then we started having uh, when you know uh, this was after, after COVID, so starting finding people that were likely to be like our audience and for them to play. And again, not having one person, but having 90 of them, 100 of external players, and sometimes we we'll ask them to play with their friends and family so that they could experience the Thank same you. sort of so social structure that was intended, right? And we kept on basically growing very, very gradually. And then we have also the courage of listening to those playtests, right? Sometimes the playtests might tell you a lot of small tactical things, but sometimes if you kind of listen to the general voice, it might tell you you, take, you need to take a step back. You need to go somewhere else, right? And I think it's easy to just read the verbatim of those feedbacks as, uh, OK, we need to tweak this on that. And it's a bit harder to take the, the sort of the, the commonalities in that feedback and decide that you need to really make a big decision, right? You guys, that was the hottest tip. That will save you months of time, what he just said. <laughs> Any follow-up, Howard? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, Massimo covered it pretty well. <laughs> yeah, so thank you all for being here. I don't know if we have the ability to do Q&A, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has questions. I actually can't see anything. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you so thank you. much, Massimo and Howard. That was thank fascinating. You, thank you.